Psalm 119, please, and verse number 65. The Bible says, Thou hast dealt well with thy servant, O Lord, according to your word. How many of you know God has done a good job? And now he says, Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I have believed your commandments. Now watch verse 67. Underline the, underline the first four words. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I have kept your word. You are good and you do good. Teach me thy statutes. The proud have forged a lie against me. But I will keep thy precepts with my whole heart. Their heart is as fat as grease. Too much pizza. <laughs> but I delight in your law. Verse 71. It is good for me that I have been afflicted. Interesting. That I might learn thy statutes. The law of my mouth or, or the law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. 73, thy hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. 74, they that fear thee will be glad when they see me because I have hoped in your word. And finally, I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right. And that thou in faithfulness hast afflicted me. I'm going to preach just a minute this morning on the subject entitled Afflicted But Advancing. I need you to say those words to about four folks around you. Afflicted but advancing. <clears throat> Let us pray and we get right into it. Father, thank you for this incredible congregation that is so wonderful in their desire toward you and your word. And I pray, God, you will fill their hearts with expectation today that they lean forward in their faith to receive something, the particulars and the details of their destiny that would enhance their walk with you. Lord, I thank you for your blood. I thank you that the blood not only cleanses us, but it also breaks curses and dismisses evil spirits from our life. So I plead your blood over this house, and I plead your blood over these people. And I ask you to help us to capture this moment in time, that it would be special for us today. And we say, even as your servant Samuel speak, Lord, your servants are listening. Now, God, I ask you to empty the stands of spectatorship today, and I call for this particular service to be a participatory service where people will respond with hearty amens and Bless the Lord and those types of things. Let their spirits get excited about what you're doing in their life. You have given us great hope and a desired end. And even though we have gone through seasons of setbacks, you've always been on our side. And we bless you today and we thank you for the anointing because the anointing makes the difference. The anointing enables us, empowers us, and equips us to do everything we're supposed to do. We say, God, anoint this place today. Anoint your people today. Anoint the preacher today. Have your way in Jesus' name. We thank you. Put your Bibles down, clap your hands, and open your mouth to Jesus Christ, the King of Kings. Come on, make his praises known in the congregation. Come on, let everybody participate. Let everybody praise him. Father, we bless you. Before you sit down, high five four people and tell them afflicted yet advancing. <clears throat> There's much we could discuss today on the subject of afflictions. The Bible uses the word afflictions no less than 86 times. There is a fantasy that some people wish to come upon them that afflictions do not exist for the people of God. I'll say it again, that's a fantasy. It's a notion so grand that some people believe they can confess their way around affliction or pray so hard that affliction don't show up. 
but the reality is that it rains on the just and the unjust. Now, I'm going to preach, but I want you to help me preach today, y'all. I'm not, I'm, we're going to get this done. Now, you may never understand the why. You will never enjoy the how or the what and never get used to the when. But rest assured, affliction will come. And when it's done, it will leave something behind. Someone once said, afflictions make the heart more deep, more experimental, more knowing and profound, and so more able to hold and contain truth. I better say that one more time. Afflictions make the heart deep, more experimental, more knowing and more profound, and so more able to hold and contain truth. The word affliction has a history with God. The word affliction tracks its way through Scripture with profound steps of order and ordinances. Afflictions are powerful, oftentimes very mysterious, but never without a mission. We find affliction in its first mention in Exodus chapter 3 and verse number 7. The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, and I know their sorrow. God said in verse number 8, I will come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and I'll bring them up out of that land unto a good land, unto a large land, unto a land that flows with milk and honey. And so right off the bat and right out the gate, the Bible says that when the people of God go through affliction and they cry out to God that God hears them, he is concerned about them, and he intends on doing something about what they are going through. Now, I just want to encourage you right early in the preface of this short little message today that affliction has a way of working a thing in you and working a thing through you. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 3, when the people cried out, God heard. But he saw it before they said anything. Watch it now. He saw it before they said anything. He saw it before they cried. The Bible says, I have seen the affliction. You can't go through anything in life that God does not see it. There is no hidden trouble. There is no veiled burden. You cannot hide what you carry from God. God sees everything at all times. Psalm 34 and verse 18 is our promise concerning afflictions. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and save such as be of a contrite spirit. Verse number 19 is also familiar to all of us where the Bible says many are the afflictions of the righteous, my God. But the Lord shall deliver him out of them all. And you gotta get a proper understanding of the word many because it's not just multitude, but it's diverse in its character. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, insinuating the idea that affliction comes in many expressions. Affliction will show up sometimes in the face of a friend. Affliction sometimes will manifest itself in your own body. Afflictions can show up in many diverse ways. And because you are righteous, do not think you're going to escape affliction. Because the Bible does not say many are the afflictions of the unrighteous. But it clarifies who he is talking to. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm going to preach now. I'm going to get out of here. But he says many are the afflictions specifically of the righteous. So because you righteous, don't get twisted. Don't think because you are so good and so holy, so saved and so sanctified that you won't have a little surprise show up at your door called affliction. Because affliction will show up at any time. Are y'all in this building? And when people look at you because you are going through your personal affliction like you are doing something wrong, remind them that according to the Bible, only righteous people really know the power 
of affliction. You don't understand that even when he first called you, according to the prophet Isaiah in chapter 48 and verse 9, he said, for my name's sake, I will defer my anger. I'm going to stop right there and tell you that God defers his anger not for your name's sake. But God does not destroy many of us to keep his name intact. Amen. And by so preserving his name, he preserves your name. Can I tell you something? Other folks might have your title, but nobody has your name. I'm, I'm going to say it one more time. Other folks may have your title, but nobody, Lord have mercy, has your name. And God has reserved unto himself a title, position, and name that nobody else can occupy. And he said, it's for my name's sake that I saved you. And for my praise, I will refrain for thee that I cut thee not off. In other words, God said, I'm not going to give up my praise by killing you. In other words, my praise is perpetual because I always solve your problem. There ain't nobody sitting in this building today breathing oxygen that's never had a problem in your life. And because you had a problem and God has solved them, now you're supposed to give him the praise for being the problem solver. Amen. God loves you. That's why he saved you. And he did it for his name's sake. His name's on the line when it comes to your purpose. I'm going to say that one more time. His name is on the line when it comes to your purpose. And he's not going to lose his integrity. He's not going to lose his character. He's not going to walk out of his sovereignty. Verse number 10 says, Behold, I have refined thee. I processed you. He said, but not with silver. He said, I did it with heat. He said, now I processed you with heat. I know nobody else in here has ever felt the fire of life where things get so hot you don't know if you could take it. He said, but I have chosen you in the furnace of affliction. He didn't say I chose you outside the furnace. He said, I chose you when you were in the furnace of affliction. In other words, God said my choosing is on a people that know how to handle the heat. I'm going to say it again. Because you walked through the fire and you did not lose your faith. God said, you the man I can use. And you the woman I can anoint. Y'all in this building? Yeah, the fire took somebody else out. But you still in this building. And God said, that's where I chose you. I chose you when I saw you going through the fire. And you kept your praise high and your worship intimate. I, I chose you when other folks walked out. But you stayed in the fight. I chose you. And Pastor Rick came back to San Antonio to remind you, place for life, that God chose you in the furnace of affliction, has a fire of its own. It has a temperature on its own. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8, for those of you who are wondering if I will theologically uh, uh, sojourn through the New Testament. We'll go there and visit the Apostle Peter. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8, he says, be sober. And be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, and you're, you do have an adversary and he is called the devil, as a roaring lion walks about seeking whom he may devour. Verse 9, the apostle Peter said, resist him in the faith. Watch now. Knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brothers that are in the world. So don't act like you're the only one the devil's attacking. Some of us get an attitude like we're the only ones going through what we're going through. And we throw our little pity parties and lock our little doors in our little bedrooms. Cry in our little cars like nobody knows the trouble I've seen. And then you wonder why other folks don't feel sorry for you. Well, the Bible says you ain't going through nothing that everybody else ain't faced. Everybody in here going through a little something. Amen. You're not special. Amen. Bump your name and tell them you're not special. Amen. This is the blessing, someone said. This is the blessing of affliction to those who will lie still and not struggle in a cowardly or a resentful way. It is God speaking to Job out of the whirlwind and saying, In the sunshine and the warmth, you cannot meet me. But in the hurricane and the darkness, when wave after wave has swept down and across the soul, you shall see my form and hear my voice and know that your Redeemer lives. Isn't that the truth? Now, all of what I said thus far 
is what I would call an introduction. We have not addressed the text. So let's just meander back to Psalm 119 and look at the text. Verse 67 of Psalm 119, TJ says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now, I keep your word. That's not the whole text. Verse 71. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. That's not the whole text. Verse 75. I know, O oh Lord, that your judgments are right. And it was in your faithfulness that you afflicted me. Interesting terminology. What is affliction? To understand what it is, you must understand first what it is not. Affliction is not torment. Torment suggests persecution. Affliction is not torture. Torture is unbearable pain. Affliction is not even tribulation. That's just a trying experience. Affliction is it agitation? You do get agitated, but it's not agitation. Agitation is just a state of anxiety. It's your personal expression when you're facing affliction. Is it agitation? No. No, it's not agitation. Is it adversity? No. Adversity is the expression and tool of affliction. So affliction is not adversity. Adversity is actually the tool that brings affliction. Here's your definition, affliction. To be lowered down, to be demoted. The most proper definition would be to be humbled. Now we know that in serving God, we have two choices. We can humble ourselves. As the apostle Peter said, humble yourselves, therefore, to God, and he will lift you up in due season. And if you do not voluntarily do that, then he will send one of his preachers to your life called Pastor Affliction. And affliction will begin to work truth in your life. But affliction shows up in interesting ways, Psalm 119, verse 67, before I was afflicted, I went astray. Now, what the writer is saying here is, before I went through affliction, I kept going off. It means to err. It means to be easily deceived about one's destiny. Wow. Affliction has a way of bringing you back to reality. Now, the prodigal son left and ended up in a pen in a land of affliction. He stepped down. And when he stepped down, he stepped out. But because he was in a pig's pen living like a slave does not mean he wasn't a son. Some of you here today have visited the pig's pen <laughs> and you used to live in a daddy's house and you're wondering about your sonship. Well, let me remind you that daddy has affliction in your land of sojourning and he will allow affliction to get your attention in order to remind you of what you left. The Bible says when the prodigal came to himself, he said, if I can get back to my daddy's house, there's something waiting on me there that is rightfully mine. But I need to remind you that Pastor Sam, he would have never realized that if affliction would not have shown up. Now he says in verse 71, it is good for me that I have been afflicted that I might learn 
your statutes. It's an affliction that you learn things you did not know before you had the affliction. I'm going to go ahead and preach this thing. It's because affliction showed up to teach me something. It's to go with skillful teaching, to prod one on, that God uses affliction. Even Jesus, according to Hebrews 5, 8, though he were a son, he learned obedience by the things he suffered. It's impossible to go through the feeling of affliction and not feel like you're suffering. But he learned obedience by what he suffered. But watch now. He said, affliction made me learn, and I'm about done here, from your statutes. And the word statutes is interesting because it means your appointments to ascribe or to cut in the stone, times, seasons, kairos, and chronos. In other words, before I was afflicted, I didn't pay attention to my appointments. Let me help you with it. Missed appointments always equal disappointments. And many people do not really show gratitude and appreciation. When God puts people, resources, relationships, and things like that in your life, we walk by them in a nonchalant way like we just don't even care. And God will sometimes send affliction in your life to remind you how important the last place you was really were to your destiny. What I just told you is... God will send affliction in order to develop appreciation in his people. Watch this. In other words, an appointment is a season when you are a time when you set aside to do a thing. Huh. And suddenly that time and that season and that appointment is not priority anymore. Don't make me bring it to church at 1030 on Sunday morning. And suddenly that appointment becomes compromised and negotiable by other things you could be involved in. And now you missed an appointment to receive a word to enhance your destiny because Jesus is the narrator of your life. And one time you could come in here a week to sit down and hear his word, but it's not important anymore because you can find better things to do and suddenly we live in a generation that has made church an option. But God didn't make it like that. He said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, especially as you see the evil day approaching. Nehemiah said, we will not forsake the house of God. I'm going to go ahead and preach this, even to people that don't like going to church. I came by to tell you that church time is an appointment time, and I'm just giving you an example. That when you miss that appointment, ultimately you may suffer disappointment. And if you miss enough God appointments, then God will send affliction in your life to make sure you make your appointments. And when you do make your appointment, you will show appreciation for the appointment you, that you did attend. In other words, don't come to church and not receive something while you're here. The statute is the ability of God to inscribe destiny into the stone of your life. In other words, God came in here to script something for your days this morning. Lord, have mercy. And if you will take advantage of this opportunity that you have made your appointment, Pastor Rick can guarantee you when you walk out this place today, you're going to walk out with your shoulders square, your head held high. You're going to walk into your money with your hand stretched out waiting to shake somebody's hand that could be your connection to your next point of destiny. Pastor Rick came by to tell you, let affliction work for you, baby. Baby. Some of you have gone through some stuff and you're here this morning because of what you've gone through. Well, I came by to remind you, you made your appointment. Now get your prescription and take care of your purpose. Tell three people I'm here, baby. I might as well get something out of it. Amen. Amen. How I, I many of you know affliction will make you go to church? Affliction will make you lift your hands. Affliction will make you put your praise on. Affliction will make sure that your appointments count. In other words, I don't want to have to go through it again. Are y'all in the building today? And then it says in verse 75, I know, oh Lord, that your judgments are right. And, you, and it's in your faithfulness you have afflicted me. In other words, now he's getting deep here now, Pastor D. In other words, he's saying, if you don't afflict me, I'm not even sure you're faithful. If you just walk out of my life and stop prodding me and stop poking me and stop driving me toward my destiny, then I have to question, are you even faithful? In other words, when I go through trouble, I don't wonder where God is. I know where he is. 
Y'all ain't hearing me. When trouble shows up, it's a reminder that God's got my back and he's sovereignly in control. He says, it's in your faithfulness that you afflicted me. You don't know that when you were disappointed by people that walked out your life that God was orchestrating the production of your purpose because you could not get to where you was going as long as they was with you. Don't be disappointed. Take the affliction and say, thank you, Jesus, for your faithfulness. He said, your judgments are, are, are right. Your judgments should, they vindicate me. The verdict is announced. Watch what he says. Oh, Lord, your judgments are right. That's why you afflicted me. Because you just, it's not fair to let me just go over there, wander out here and just die and not live in my purpose. In other words, you sent an angel, I didn't listen. You sent a comforter, I couldn't hear it. But you're so faithful, you sent trouble and affliction to get my attention. I'm preaching better than you saying amen right now. Oh, Lord. He said, you're faithful. Your judgments are, are, are right. The verdict is announced. Watch now. It literally means to govern the purpose by giving verdicts. Why? For reason of vindicating. In other words, God lets you go through stuff. I said it a hundred times because he trusts you. He don't trust everybody with what you personally have endured, honey. Because he knew he could stand up after you pass through the fire, look at everybody else and say, consider my servant. I need you to look at four people and tell them, God, trust me with this pain. He trusts me with disappointment. He trusts me with affliction. He trusts me with trouble. He trusts me with this stuff. I leave it alone now. Whew. Hot, overweight. I'm almost done. So you say, all right. Pastor Rick, we know now that God uses affliction. That he remains sovereign in affliction. He taught us all this. We know now that before we was afflicted, we wandered everywhere. <laughs> but once affliction showed up, we stopped paying attention. Right. <laughs> affliction made me keep my appointments. <laughs> because every missed appointment equals a disappointment. So no, now I no longer take handshakes for granted. I don't miss church. <laughs> Amen. That's just for me. Amen. You ever wonder what's going on behind the scenes when affliction is happening on the platform? <laughs> In other words, everybody's seeing your affliction. <laughs> and it gives them a great opportunity to start speaking their mind. <laughs> look. Look now. Look now. Look, look now. You ever felt like that was everybody, the, the, the spectators of scrutiny in the stands of your destiny? <laughs> yeah, I told you now what? Now. Mm -hmm, what? Like God's not in control. Exodus chapter 1, verse 8. There arose up a new king over Egypt, which did not know Joseph. <laughs> that's trouble already. Ooh, that's trouble. Because Joseph had favor. But what, would you, what you going to do when favor's gone and a new kind of rulership shows up? Behold, the people of the children of, watch what he said. And he said, this ruler said unto the people, behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we are. Now he's confused. 
Watch verse 10. Come on. He said, we're going to deal with them wisely. Because if we don't, they will multiply and it will come to pass that when there falls out any war, they join our enemies and fight against us. Now, this is Egypt talking. And they'll leave our land. Therefore, watch now, they did set over them taskmasters to what? To afflict them with burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities. Watch the next verse. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. I want you to look at somebody next to you and tell them we know something they don't know. <laughs> when it looks like we are being treated like slaves, when it looks like we have to submit to every order given, and we no longer have power, don't fool yourself because there's something underground going on. There's something behind the scenes because when you think we losing, we actually multiplying and growing. What I just said is tell God, bring on all the affliction you want, God, because it's just making me bigger and better. It's making me stronger and larger. So what I just said is the longer the affliction lasts, the bigger you're going to be when you come out of it. So stop fussing. Stop complaining. And say, God, all I know is I feel like I'm going through hell right now. I feel like I'm under more loss. Things are going crazy, but I know I'm multiplying and I am growing. If you believe that today, jump on your feet, give God crazy praise, and we're about to close. <laughs> Amen. Praise your name, Jesus. Come on, y'all. I'm a little tired. Help me. Somebody lift their voice and give him praise today. He never said affliction was pleasurable, but it's always purposeful. I'm going to say it again. He never said affliction was pleasurable, but it's always purposeful. How do you know you're going through affliction? Watch now. Watch Pastor Rick. When you used to be standing here, and now you're standing here. Watch this. You used to be here, but now you're here. When you hear, that's a good sign. You lost some stuff. How do you think Joseph felt when his own brothers threw him in a pit? He felt demoted. He felt afflicted. But that first affliction was a first sign that he was heading to a palace that he dreamed of when he was just a young man. Don't freak out when you have a dream and your first step is down. Y'all not hear me preach. Don't freak out when you have a dream and your first step is down. Because it's a sign that God is about to get in your mess and turn that thing around. Now watch. Psalm 66 says this, and I'm done, verse 10. For thou, O God, has proved us. You tried us as silver is tried. You brought us into a net, and you laid affliction upon our loins. You caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire. We went through water. Watch what he says. But you brought us out into a wealthy place. You brought us out where? Into a wealthy place. I want you to look at four people and tell them I'm on my way to a wealthy place. Amen. Tell them again, I'm on my way. To How do I know? Because I've been through affliction. Say it again, I'm on my way to a wealthy place. 
How do I know? Because I've gone through affliction. I've gone through pain. I've gone through pits. I've gone through problems. My next place is a wealthy place. Let's stand. Let's stand. Say it with me. My next place is a wealthy place. So don't get confused with the place I'm in. Amen. How many of you know you can't ever count God's people out? In our worst condition, we in our best position. Did y'all hear, Pastor Rick, in your worst condition, you in your best position? I'm going to say it one more time. Lord have mercy. In your worst condition, you are in your best position. Pastor Rick came by to tell you, get ready, because God is about to do a thing. Your affliction is a sign that you're going in the right direction. Shout it with me. Afflicted, but advancing. Amen.